Kristalina Gorgieva, thanks so much for joining us on G Zero World. Thank you for having me. I want to start, of course, with the fact that uh, the global economy seems to be getting worse. Is a global recession now inevitable in your view? And if so, why? Well, the uh, risks of uh, global recession have gone up. And uh, the reasons are three. One, we have all large economies slowing down at the same time. Eurozone, because of Russia's invasion and high ga gas prices. China, because of uh, Omicron disruptions and the uh, housing sector, the real estate sector in trouble. The US still holding relatively better, but the momentum is towards slowdown as well. And that takes me to the second reason, inflation. High inflation means tightening financial conditions. And higher interest rates are a drag on consumer demand. They are a drag on investment, making the slowdown more uh, likely. And the third reason we are a bit uh, more concerned about the future is fragmentation. The world economy uh, is uh, finding it harder to have solutions to common uh, problems in this uh, environment. Now, usually, at least when we talk about China historically, when things go badly, the ability of the Chinese government to throw a lot of money at the problem, kick it down the road, and ensure that there's growth and stimulus, we often see that. We certainly saw it coming out of 2008. Um, first of all, um, do, do the Chinese have that capacity this time around? And secondly, are you starting to feel more optimistic for 2023 um, about them finally getting out of this zero COVID stop, start, stop, start? Uh, the answer to the first question is, uh, yes, China does have policy space. And we have seen very recently that they are, de they are deploying 85 billion for their property sector. But if you look at history, you would notice that China has three drivers to increase uh, uh, growth. The first one is the real estate sector, which even with the support it is getting today, cannot be the same potent force. The second one is infrastructure financing. China has done a lot in infrastructure and municipalities are now under more debt than they were before. And the and third trade. one is export. Yeah. But export in a fragmented world is lesser, uh, has lesser potential than it had uh, before. Uh, okay, so that's China. When we look at the Europeans, um, I certainly, when I look at the electricity bills, my God, I mean, 5x, sometimes 10x what they were a year ago. I also have the Europeans telling me they expect it's going to be a lot worse in 2023 than it is this winter. Is that your sense? Uh, yes, unfortunately, this is correct. This winter the reduction in gas supplies has caused this spike in uh, energy prices. And of course, uh, oil has also been at, at, on the highest end of the uh, price spectrum. But Europe did have reserves and Europe has been able to cushion itself against uh, massive reduction and, and actually stopping uh, gas supplies from Russia. Would that be the case next winter? Uh, very uh, likely that Russia would continue to use gas as a uh, uh, factor of response to what has, has been, uh, uh, understandably, a very, very strong reaction from the uh, uh, global communi community to a senseless war. Uh, and that, therefore, we may see next winter to be even harder for Europe. But the silver lining here is that Europe is going to accelerate its green transition. This is so clear. And for the world, this is really good news. It means new technologies accelerating the deployment of existing uh, technologies. And uh, if we are to take a brave step towards uh, making it easier for private capital to go into emerging markets, 
with these technologies, we may have a chance to buffer ourselves against the climate crisis. Now, you, you bring me to the developing world, um, and, and certainly, I mean, everything seems to roll downhill at them. Whether we're talking about inflation, whether we're talking about the pandemic, whether we're talking about the Russian invasion, everything's hitting them the hardest. Do you expect crises? Do you expect, like, literally, that there's going to have to be dramatic intervention or we're going to see some, some financial collapse? Uh, you are so right. It is a cost of living crisis in so many places. Hardest for emerging markets and developing uh, e economies for people there. And don't forget, when we talk about tightening of financial conditions, for emerging markets and developing economies, this includes both interest rates going up, but also the dollar going up, depreciation of their currencies. It translates into importing more inflation, making lives of people even more difficult. So in this environment, you're, you're also right to concentrate on food security because this is where the devastation for especially low-income countries is so dramatic. Uh, we have identified 48 countries that are suffering from uh, food insecurity. And uh, I think next year may be even harder. Why? Because this year we had natural disasters, climatic disasters on all continents that is affecting agricultural productivity. And we have prices of uh, fertilizers th going through the roof. That makes it so hard for farmers in these countries to produce what is necessary. At the IMF, we still have about $700 billion lending capacity. We're seeing a, an increase in demand for IMF financing. Since the war started, we have funded 18 programs or augmented programs. This is about $90 billion just in this short period of time. We have to brace for more shocks to come, anticipate them, be ready, act early. Okay, last question for you, and it can be a quick one. I saw you give a speech recently at Georgetown. You said that we can survive recession, we can survive inflation, we cannot survive unabated climate crisis. Kristalina, how much progress have we lost over the last year? How much progress have we lost because of these crises, particularly the Russian invasion uh, in responding to climate? Well, you look at the emissions uh, going up, even when the economy is slowing down. So we have lost uh, time. Uh, and the question is, are we eager to move, to catch up? And that is something that, that we have to press very hard for, uh, Ian, because uh, time is not our friend. If we don't take the turn towards lower carbon intensity by the end of this decade, doesn't matter what promises we make for 2050, because we would not be able to meet them. Now, I want to finish on a positive note. We have created at the IMF a new vehicle to support the green transition. It is called Resilience and Sustainability Trust. $40 billion committed for it. And what gives me great joy is that the interest is very high. That means emerging markets, developing countries, they know they have to deal with the climate crisis before it becomes a devastation. Kristalina Gorgeva at the IMF, thank you so much. And of course, wishing you a very successful annual meeting. Thank you.